Chapter One and Two of Ward Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. Chapters One and Two. chapter one in the hospital yard there stands a small lodge surrounded by a perfect forest of burdocks nettles and wild hemp its roof is rusty the chimney is tumbling down the steps at the front door are rotting away and overgrown with grass and there are only traces left of the stucco the front of the lodge faces the hospital at the back it looks out into the open country from which it is separated by the grey hospital fence with nails on it these nails with their points upwards and the fence and the lodge itself have that peculiar desolate god-forsaken look which is only found in our hospital and prison buildings if you are not afraid of being stung by the nettles come by the narrow footpath that leads to the lodge and let us see what is going on inside opening the first door we walk into the entry here along the walls and by the stove every sort of hospital rubbish lies littered about mattresses old tattered dressing-gowns trousers blue striped shirts boots and shoes no good for anything all these remnants are piled up in heaps mixed up and crumpled mouldering and giving out a sickly smell the porter nikita an old soldier wearing rusty good conduct stripes is always lying on the litter with a pipe between his teeth he has a grim surly battered-looking face overhanging eyebrows which give him the expression of a sheepdog of the steppes and a red nose he is short and looks thin and scraggy but he is of imposing deportment and his fists are vigorous he belongs to the class of simple-hearted practical and dull-witted people prompt in carrying out orders who like discipline better than anything in the world and so are convinced that it is their duty to beat people he showers blows on the face on the chest on the back on whatever comes first and is convinced that there would be no order in the place if he did not next you come into a big spacious room which fills up the whole lodge except for the entry here the walls are painted a dirty blue the ceiling is as sooty as in a hut without a chimney it is evident that in the winter the stove smokes and the room is full of fumes the windows are disfigured by iron gratings on the inside the wooden floor is grey and full of splinters there is a stench of sour cabbage of smouldering wicks of bugs and of ammonia and for the first minute this stench gives you the impression of having walked into a menagerie there are bedsteads screwed to the floor men in blue hospital dressing-gowns and wearing nightcaps in the old style are sitting and lying on them these are the lunatics there are five of them in all here only one is of the upper class the rest are all artisans the one nearest the door a tall lean workman with shining red whiskers and tear-stained eyes sits with his head propped on his hand staring at the same point day and night he grieves shaking his head sighing and smiling bitterly he takes a part in conversation and usually makes no answer to questions he eats and drinks mechanically when food is offered him from his agonizing throbbing cough his thinness and the flush on his cheeks one may judge that he is in the first stage of consumption next to him is a little alert very lively old man with a pointed beard and curly black hair like a negro's by day he walks up and down the ward from window to window or sits on his bed cross-legged like a turk and ceaselessly as a bullfinch whistles softly sings and titters he shows his childish gaiety and lively character at night also when he gets up to say his prayers that is to beat himself on the chest with his fists and to scratch with his fingers at the door this is the jew moiseka an imbecile who went crazy twenty years ago when his hat factory was burnt down and of all the inhabitants of ward number six he is the only one who is allowed to go out of the lodge and even out of the yard into the street he has enjoyed this privilege for years probably because he is an old inhabitant of the hospital a quiet harmless imbecile the buffoon of the town where people are used to seeing him surrounded by boys and dogs in his wretched gown in his absurd nightcap 
and in slippers, sometimes with bare legs and even without trousers, he walks about the streets, stopping at the gates and little shops and begging for a copper. In one place they will give him some kvass, in another some bread, in another a copper, so that he generally goes back to the ward feeling rich and well-fed. Everything that he brings back Nikita takes from him for his own benefit. The soldier does this roughly, angrily turning the Jew's pockets inside out and calling God to witness that he will not let him go into the street again, and that breach of the regulations is worse to him than anything in the world. Moiseka likes to make himself useful. He gives his companions water and covers them up when they are asleep. He promises each of them to bring him back a kopeck and to make him a new cap. He feeds with a spoon his neighbor on the left who is paralyzed. He acts in this way not from compassion nor from any considerations of a humane kind, but through imitation, unconsciously dominated by Gromov, his neighbor on the right hand. Ivan Dmitritch Gromov, a man of thirty-three, who is a gentleman by birth and has been a court usher and provincial secretary, suffers from the mania of persecution either lies curled up in bed or walks from corner to corner as though for exercise he very rarely sits down he is always excited agitated and overwrought by a sort of vague undefined expectation the faintest rattle in the entry or shout in the yard is enough to make him raise his head and begin listening whether they are coming for him whether they are looking for him and at such times his face expresses the utmost uneasiness and repulsion i like his broad face with its high cheekbones always pale and unhappy and reflecting as though in a mirror a soul tormented by conflict and long-continued terror his grimaces are strange and abnormal but the delicate lines traced on his face by profound genuine suffering show intelligence and sense and there is a warm and healthy light in his eyes i like the man himself courteous anxious to be of use and extraordinarily gentle to everyone except nikita when anyone drops a button or a spoon he jumps up from his bed quickly and picks it up every day he says good morning to his companions and when he goes to bed he wishes them good night besides his continually overwrought condition and his grimaces his madness shows itself in the following way also sometimes in the evenings he wraps himself in his dressing-gown and trembling all over with his teeth chattering begins walking rapidly from corner to corner and between the bedsteads it seems as though he is in a violent fever from the way he suddenly stops and glances at his companions it can be seen that he is longing to say something very important but apparently reflecting that they would not listen or would not understand him he shakes his head impatiently and goes on pacing up and down but soon the desire to speak gets the upper hand of every consideration and he will let himself go and speak fervently and passionately his talk is disordered and feverish like delirium disconnected and not always intelligible but on the other hand something extremely fine may be felt in it both in the words and the voice when he talks you recognize in him the lunatic and the man it is difficult to reproduce on paper his insane talk he speaks of the baseness of mankind of violence trampling on justice of the glorious life which will one day be upon earth of the window gratings which remind him every minute of the stupidity and cruelty of oppressors it makes a disorderly incoherent potpourri of themes old but not yet out of date chapter two some twelve or fifteen years ago an official called gromov a highly respectable and prosperous person was living in his own house in the principal street of the town he had two sons sergey and ivan when sergey was a student in his fourth year he was taken ill with galloping consumption and died and his death was as it were the first of a whole series of calamities which suddenly showered on the gromov family within a week of sergey's funeral the old father was put on trial for fraud and misappropriation and he died of typhoid in the prison hospital soon afterwards the house with all their belongings was sold by auction and ivan dmitritch and his mother were left entirely without means hitherto in his father's lifetime ivan dmitritch who was studying in the university of petersburg had received an allowance of sixty or seventy roubles a month and had had no conception of poverty 
now he had to make an abrupt change in his life he had to spend his time from morning to night giving lessons for next to nothing to work at copying and with all that to go hungry as all his earnings were sent to keep his mother ivan dmitritch could not stand such a life he lost heart and strength and giving up the university went home here through interest he obtained the post of teacher in the district school but could not get on with his colleagues was not liked by the boys and soon gave up the post his mother died he was for six months without work living on nothing but bread and water then he became a court usher he kept this post until he was dismissed owing to his illness he had never even in his young student days given the impression of being perfectly healthy he had always been pale thin and given to catching cold he ate little and slept badly a single glass of wine went to his head and made him hysterical he always had a craving for society but owing to his irritable temperament and suspiciousness he never became very intimate with any one and had no friends he always spoke with contempt of his fellow townsmen saying that their coarse ignorance and sleepy animal existence seemed to him loathsome and horrible he spoke in a loud tenor with heat and invariably either with scorn and indignation or with wonder and enthusiasm and always with perfect sincerity whatever one talked to him about he always brought it round to the same subject that life was dull and stifling in the town that the townspeople had no lofty interests but lived a dingy meaningless life diversified by violence coarse profligacy and hypocrisy that scoundrels were well fed and clothed while honest men lived from hand to mouth that they needed schools a progressive local paper a theatre public lectures the coordination of the intellectual elements that society must see its failings and be horrified in his criticisms of people he laid on the colours thick using only black and white and no fine shades mankind was divided for him into honest men and scoundrels there was nothing in between he always spoke with passion and enthusiasm of women and of love but he had never been in love in spite of the severity of his judgments and his nervousness he was liked and behind his back was spoken of affectionately as vanya his innate refinement and readiness to be of service his good breeding his moral purity and his shabby coat his frail appearance and family misfortunes aroused a kind warm sorrowful feeling moreover he was well educated and well read according to the townspeople's notions he knew everything and was in their eyes something like a walking encyclopedia he had read a great deal he would sit at the club nervously pulling at his beard and looking through the magazines and books and from his face one could see that he was not reading but devouring the pages without giving himself time to digest what he read it must be supposed that reading was one of his morbid habits as he fell upon anything that came into his hands with equal avidity even last year's newspapers and calendars at home he always read lying down end of section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapters three and four of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter three. One autumn morning, Ivan Dmitritch, turning up the collar of his greatcoat and splashing through the mud, made his way by side streets and back lanes to see some artisan and to collect some payment that was owing he was in a gloomy mood as he always was in the morning in one of the side streets he was met by two convicts in fetters and four soldiers with rifles in charge of them ivan dmitritch had very often met convicts before and they had always excited feelings of compassion and discomfort in him but now this meeting made a peculiar strange impression on him it suddenly seemed to him for some reason that he too might be put into fetters and led through the mud to prison like that after visiting the artisan on the way home he met near the post office a police superintendent of his acquaintance who greeted him and walked a few paces along the street with him and for some reason this seemed to him suspicious 
At home he could not get the convicts or the soldiers with their rifles out of his head all day, and an unaccountable inward agitation prevented him from reading or concentrating his mind. In the evening he did not light his lamp, and at night he could not sleep, but kept thinking that he might be arrested, put into fetters, and thrown into prison. He did not know of any harm he had done, and could be certain that he would never be guilty of murder, arson, or theft in the future either. But was it not easy to commit a crime by accident, unconsciously? And was not false witness always possible, and indeed miscarriage of justice? It was not without good reason that the age-long experience of the simple people teaches that beggary and prison are ills none can be safe from. A judicial mistake is very possible, as legal proceedings are conducted nowadays, and there is nothing to be wondered at in it. People who have an official, professional relation to other men's sufferings, for instance judges, police officers, doctors, in course of time, through habit, grow so callous that they cannot, even if they wish it, take any but a formal attitude to their clients. In this respect they are not different from the peasant who slaughters sheep and calves in the backyard and does not notice the blood. With this formal, soulless attitude to human personality, the judge needs but one thing, time, in order to deprive an innocent man of all rights of property and to condemn him to penal servitude. Only the time spent on performing certain formalities for which the judge has paid his salary, and then it is all over. Then you may look in vain for justice and protection in this dirty, wretched little town a hundred and fifty miles from a railway station. And indeed, is it not absurd even to think of justice when every kind of violence is accepted by society as a rational and consistent necessity, and every act of mercy, for instance a verdict of acquittal, calls forth a perfect outburst of dissatisfied and revengeful feeling. In the morning Ivan Dmitritch got up from his bed in a state of horror, with cold perspiration on his forehead, completely convinced that he might be arrested at any minute. Since his gloomy thoughts of yesterday had haunted him so long, he thought, it must be that there was some truth in them. They could not indeed have come into his mind without any ground whatever. A policeman walking slowly passed by the windows, that was not for nothing. Here were two men standing still and silent near the house. Why were they silent? An agonizing days and nights followed for Ivan Dmitritch. Everyone who passed by the windows or came into the yard seemed to him a spy or a detective. At midday the chief of the police usually drove down the street with a pair of horses. He was going from his estate near the town to the police department but Ivan Dmitritch fancied every time that he was driving especially quickly, and that he had a peculiar expression. It was evident that he was in haste to announce that there was a very important criminal in the town. Ivan Dmitritch started at every ring at the bell and knock at the gate, and was agitated whenever he came upon anyone new at his landlady's. When he met police officers and gendarmes, he smiled and began whistling so as to seem unconcerned. He could not sleep for whole nights in succession, expecting to be arrested, but he snored loudly and sighed as though in deep sleep, that his landlady might think he was asleep. For if he could not sleep it meant that he was tormented by the stings of conscience. What a piece of evidence! Facts and common sense persuaded him that all these terrors were nonsense and morbidity, that if one looked at the matter more broadly there was nothing really terrible in arrest and imprisonment so long as the conscience is at ease. But the more sensibly and logically he reasoned, the more acute and agonizing his mental distress became. It might be compared with the story of a hermit who tried to cut a dwelling place for himself in a virgin forest. The more zealously he worked with his axe, the thicker the forest grew. In the end, Ivan Dmitritch, seeing it was useless, gave up reasoning altogether and abandoned himself entirely to despair and terror he began to avoid people and to seek solitude his official work had been distasteful to him before now it became unbearable to him he was afraid they would somehow get him into trouble would put a bribe in his pocket unnoticed and then denounce him or that he would accidentally make a mistake in official papers that would appear to be fraudulent or would lose other people's money it is strange that his imagination had never at other times been so agile and inventive as now when every day he thought of thousands of different reasons for being seriously anxious over his freedom and honour 
but on the other hand his interest in the outer world in books in particular grew sensibly fainter and his memory began to fail him in the spring when the snow melted there were found in the ravine near the cemetery two half decomposed corpses the bodies of an old woman and a boy bearing the traces of death by violence nothing was talked of but these bodies and their unknown murderers that people might not think he had been guilty of the crime ivan dmitritch walked about the streets smiling and when he met acquaintances he turned pale flushed and began declaring that there was no greater crime than the murder of the weak and defenceless but this duplicity soon exhausted him and after some reflection he decided that in his position the best thing to do was to hide in his landlady's cellar he sat in the cellar all day and then all night then another day was fearfully cold and waiting till dusk stole secretly like a thief back to his room he stood in the middle of the room till daybreak listening without stirring very early in the morning before sunrise some workmen came into the house ivan dmitritch knew perfectly well that they had come to mend the stove in the kitchen but terror told him that they were police officers disguised as workmen he slipped stealthily out of the flat and overcome by terror ran along the street without his cap and coat dogs raced after him barking a peasant shouted somewhere behind him the wind whistled in his ears and it seemed to ivan dmitritch that the force and violence of the whole world was massed together behind his back and was chasing after him he was stopped and brought home and his landlady sent for a doctor dr andrey yefimitch of whom we shall have more to say hereafter prescribed cold compresses on his head and laurel drops shook his head and went away telling the landlady he should not come again as one should not interfere with people who are going out of their minds as he had not the means to live at home and be nursed ivan dmitritch was soon sent to the hospital and was there put into the ward for venereal patients he could not sleep at night was full of whims and fancies and disturbed the patients and was soon afterwards by andrey yefimitch's orders transferred to ward number six within a year ivan dmitritch was completely forgotten in the town and his books heaped up by his landlady in a sledge in the shed were pulled to pieces by boys chapter four ivan dmitritch's neighbour on the left hand is as i have said already the jew moiseka his neighbour on the right hand is a peasant so rolling in fat that he is almost spherical with a blankly stupid face utterly devoid of thought this is a motionless gluttonous unclean animal who has long ago lost all powers of thought or feeling an acrid stifling stench always comes from him nikita who has to clean up after him beats him terribly with all his might not sparing his fists and what is dreadful is not his being beaten that one can get used to but the fact that this stupefied creature does not respond to the blows with a sound or a movement nor by a look in the eyes but only sways a little like a heavy barrel the fifth and last inhabitant of ward number six is a man of the artisan class who had once been a sorter in the post office a thinnish fair little man with a good-natured but rather sly face to judge from the clear cheerful look in his calm and intelligent eyes he has some pleasant idea in his mind and has some very important and agreeable secret he has under his pillow and under his mattress something that he never shows any one not from fear of its being taken from him and stolen but from modesty sometimes he goes to the window and turning his back to his companions puts something on his breast and bending his head looks at it if you go up to him at such a moment he is overcome with confusion and snatches something off his breast but it is not difficult to guess his secret congratulate me he often says to ivan dmitritch i have been presented with the stanislav order of the second degree with the star the second degree with the star is only given to foreigners but for some reason they want to make an exception for me he says with a smile shrugging his shoulders in perplexity that i must confess i did not expect i don't understand anything about that ivan dmitritch replies morosely but do you know what i shall attain to sooner or later the former sorter persists screwing up his eyes slyly i shall certainly get the swedish polar star that's an order it is worth working for a white cross with a black ribbon it's very beautiful probably in no other place is life so monotonous as in this ward 
in the morning the patients except the paralytic and the fat peasant wash in the entry at a big tub and wipe themselves with the skirts of their dressing gowns after that they drink tea out of tin mugs which nikita brings them out of the main building every one is allowed one mugful at midday they have soup made out of sour cabbage and boiled grain in the evening their supper consists of grain left from dinner in the intervals they lie down sleep look out of window and walk from one corner to the other and so every day even the former sorter always talks of the same orders fresh faces are rarely seen in ward number six the doctor has not taken in any new mental cases for a long time and the people who are fond of visiting lunatic asylums are few in this world once every two months semyon lazaritch the barber appears in the ward how he cuts the patient's hair and how nikita helps him to do it and what a trepidation the lunatics are always thrown into by the arrival of the drunken smiling barber we will not describe no one even looks into the ward except the barber the patients are condemned to see day after day no one but nikita a rather strange rumor has however been circulating in the hospital of late it is rumored that the doctor has begun to visit ward number six End of chapters three and four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five of ward number six by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five a strange rumour dr andrey yefimitch ragin is a strange man in his way they say that when he was young he was very religious and prepared himself for a clerical career and that when he had finished his studies at the high school in eighteen sixty three he intended to enter a theological academy but that his father a surgeon and doctor of medicine jeered at him and declared point-blank that he would disown him if he became a priest how far this is true i don't know but andrey yefimitch himself has more than once confessed that he has never had a natural bent for medicine or science in general however that may have been when he finished his studies in the medical faculty he did not enter the priesthood he showed no special devoutness and was no more like a priest at the beginning of his medical career than he is now his exterior is heavy coarse like a peasant's his face his beard his flat hair and his coarse clumsy figure suggest an overfed intemperate and harsh innkeeper on the high road his face is surly looking and covered with blue veins his eyes are little and his nose is red with his height and broad shoulders he has huge hands and feet one would think that a blow from his fist would knock the life out of any one but his step is soft and his walk is cautious and insinuating when he meets any one in a narrow passage he is always the first to stop and make way and to say not in a bass as one would expect but in a high soft tenor i beg your pardon he has a little swelling on his neck which prevents him from wearing stiff starched collars and so he always goes about in soft linen or cotton shirts altogether he does not dress like a doctor he wears the same suit for ten years and the new clothes which he usually buys at a jewish shop look as shabby and crumpled on him as his old ones he sees patients and dines and pays visits all in the same coat but this is not due to niggardliness but to complete carelessness about his appearance when Andrey Yefimitch came to the town to take up his duties, the institution founded to the glory of God was in a terrible condition. One could hardly breathe for the stench in the wards, in the passages, and in the courtyards of the hospital. The hospital servants, the nurses, and their children slept in the wards together with the patients. They complained that there was no living for beetles, bugs, and mice. The surgical wards were never free from erysipelas there were only two scalpels and not one thermometer in the whole hospital potatoes were kept in the baths the superintendent the housekeeper and the medical assistant robbed the patients and of the old doctor andrey yefimitch's predecessor people declared that he secretly sold the hospital alcohol and that he kept a regular harem consisting of nurses and female patients 
these disorderly proceedings were perfectly well known in the town and were even exaggerated but people took them calmly some justified them on the ground that there were only peasants and working men in the hospital who could not be dissatisfied since they were much worse off at home than in the hospital they couldn't be fed on woodcocks others said in excuse that the town alone without help from the zemstvo was not equal to maintaining a good hospital thank god for having one at all even a poor one and the newly formed zemstvo did not open infirmaries either in the town or the neighbourhood relying on the fact that the town already had its hospital after looking over the hospital andrey yefimitch came to the conclusion that it was an immoral institution and extremely prejudicial to the health of the townspeople in his opinion the most sensible thing that could be done was to let out the patients and close the hospital but he reflected that his will alone was not enough to do this and that it would be useless if physical and moral impurity were driven out of one place they would only move to another one must wait for it to wither away of itself besides if people open a hospital and put up with having it it must be because they need it superstition and all the nastiness and abominations of daily life were necessary since in process of time they worked out to something sensible just as manure turns into black earth there was nothing on earth so good that it had not something nasty about its first origin when andrey yefimitch undertook his duties he was apparently not greatly concerned about the irregularities at the hospital he only asked the attendants and nurses not to sleep in the wards and had two cupboards of instruments put up the superintendent the housekeeper the medical assistant and the erysipelas remained unchanged andrey yefimitch loved intelligence and honesty intensely but he had no strength of will nor belief in his right to organize an intelligent and honest life about him he was utterly unable to give orders to forbid things and to insist it seemed as though he had taken a vow never to raise his voice and never to make use of the imperative it was difficult for him to say fetch or bring when he wanted his meals he would cough hesitatingly and say to the cook how about tea or how about dinner to dismiss the superintendent or to tell him to leave off stealing or to abolish the unnecessary parasitic post altogether was absolutely beyond his powers when andrey yefimitch was deceived or flattered or accounts he knew to be cooked were brought him to sign he would turn as red as a crab and feel guilty but yet he would sign the accounts when the patients complained to him of being hungry or of the roughness of the nurses he would be confused and mutter guiltily very well very well i will go into it later most likely there is some misunderstanding at first andrey yefimitch worked very zealously he saw patients every day from morning till dinner time performed operations and even attended confinements the ladies said of him that he was attentive and clever at diagnosing diseases especially those of women and children but in process of time the work unmistakably wearied him by its monotony and obvious uselessness to-day one sees thirty patients and to-morrow they have increased to thirty-five the next day forty and so on from day to day from year to year while the mortality in the town did not decrease and the patients did not leave off coming to be any real help to forty patients between morning and dinner was not physically possible so it could but lead to deception if twelve thousand patients were seen in a year it meant if one looked at it simply that twelve thousand men were deceived to put those who were seriously ill into wards and to treat them according to the principles of science was impossible too because though there were principles there was no science if he were to put aside philosophy and pedantically follow the rules as other doctors did the things above all necessary were cleanliness and ventilation instead of dirt wholesome nourishment instead of broth made of stinking sour cabbage and good assistance instead of thieves and indeed why hinder people dying if death is the normal and legitimate end of every one what is gained if some shopkeeper or clerk lives an extra five or ten years if the aim of medicine is by drugs to alleviate suffering the question forces itself on one why alleviate it in the first place they say that suffering leads man to perfection and in the second if mankind really learns to alleviate its sufferings with pills and drops it will completely abandon religion and philosophy in which it has hitherto found not merely protection from all sorts of trouble but even happiness 
pushkin suffered terrible agonies before his death poor heine lay paralyzed for several years why then should not some andrey yefimitch or matryona savishna be ill since their lives had nothing of importance in them and would have been entirely empty and like the life of an amoeba except for suffering oppressed by such reflections andrey yefimitch relaxed his efforts and gave up visiting the hospital every day End of chapter 5 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 6 of Ward No. 6 by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861-1946 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six his life was passed like this as a rule he got up at eight o'clock in the morning dressed and drank his tea then he sat down in his study to read or went to the hospital at the hospital the outpatients were sitting in the dark narrow little corridor waiting to be seen by the doctor the nurses and the attendants tramping with their boots over the brick floors ran by them gaunt-looking patients in dressing-gowns passed dead bodies and vessels full of filth were carried by the children were crying and there was a cold draught andrey yefimitch knew that such surroundings were torture to feverish consumptive and impressionable patients but what could be done in the consulting-room he was met by his assistant sergey sergeyitch a fat little man with a plump well-washed shaven face with soft smooth manners wearing a new loosely cut suit and looking more like a senator than a medical assistant he had an immense practice in the town wore a white tie and considered himself more proficient than the doctor who had no practice in the corner of the consulting-room there stood a large icon in a shrine with a heavy lamp in front of it and near it a candle-stand with a white cover on it on the walls hung portraits of bishops a view of the Tsvatogorsky monastery and wreaths of dried cornflowers sergey sergeyitch was religious and liked solemnity and decorum the icon had been put up at his expense at his instructions some one of the patients read the hymns of praise in the consulting room on sundays and after the reading sergey sergeyitch himself went through the wards with a censer and burned incense there were a great many patients but the time was short and so the work was confined to the asking of a few brief questions and the administration of some drugs such as castor oil or volatile ointment andrey yefimitch would sit with his cheek resting in his hand lost in thought and asking questions mechanically sergey sergeyitch sat down too rubbing his hands and from time to time putting in his word we suffer pain and poverty he would say because we do not pray to the merciful god as we should yes andrey yefimitch never performed any operation when he was seeing patients he had long ago given up doing so and the sight of blood upset him when he had to open a child's mouth in order to look at its throat and the child cried and tried to defend itself with its little hands the noise in his ears made his head go round and brought tears to his eyes he would make haste to prescribe a drug and motioned to the woman to take the child away he was soon wearied by the timidity of the patients and their incoherence by the proximity of the pious sergey sergeyitch by the portraits on the walls and by his own questions which he had asked over and over again for twenty years and he would go away after seeing five or six patients the rest would be seen by his assistant in his absence with the agreeable thought that thank god he had no private practice now and that no one would interrupt him andrey yefimitch sat down to the table immediately on reaching home and took up a book he read a great deal and always with enjoyment half his salary went on buying books and of the six rooms that made up his abode three were heaped up with books and old magazines he liked best of all works on history and philosophy the only medical publication to which he subscribed was the doctor of which he always read the last pages first he would always go on reading for several hours without a break and without being weary he did not read as rapidly and impulsively as ivan dmitritch had done in the past but slowly and with concentration 
often pausing over a passage which he liked or did not find intelligible near the books there always stood a decanter of vodka and a salted cucumber or a pickled apple lay beside it not on a plate but on the baize tablecloth every half hour he would pour himself out a glass of vodka and drink it without taking his eyes off the book then without looking at it he would feel for the cucumber and bite off a bit at three o'clock he would go cautiously to the kitchen door cough and say daryushka what about dinner after his dinner a rather poor and untidily served one andrey yefimitch would walk up and down his rooms with his arms folded thinking the clock would strike four then five and still he would be walking up and down thinking occasionally the kitchen door would creak and the red and sleepy face of daryushka would appear andrey yefimitch isn't it time for you to have your beer she would ask anxiously no it's not time yet he would answer i'll wait a little i'll wait a little towards the evening the postmaster mikhail averyanitch the only man in town whose society did not bore andrey yefimitch would come in mikhail averyanitch had once been a very rich landowner and had served in the cavalry but had come to ruin and was forced by poverty to take a job in the post office late in life he had a hale and hearty appearance luxuriant grey whiskers the manners of a well-bred man and a loud pleasant voice he was good-natured and emotional but hot-tempered when any one in the post office made a protest expressed disagreement or even began to argue mikhail avryanitch would turn crimson shake all over and shout in a voice of thunder hold your tongue so that the post office had long enjoyed the reputation of an institution which it was terrible to visit mikhail averyanitch liked and respected andrey yefimitch for his culture and the loftiness of his soul he treated the other inhabitants of the town superciliously as though they were his subordinates here i am he would say going into andrey yefimitch good evening my dear fellow i'll be bound you are getting sick of me aren't you on the contrary i am delighted said the doctor i am always glad to see you the friends would sit on the sofa in the study and for some time would smoke in silence daryushka what about the beer andrey yefimitch would say they would drink their first bottle still in silence the doctor brooding and mikhail averyanitch with a gay and animated face like a man who has something very interesting to tell the doctor was always the one to begin the conversation what a pity he would say quietly and slowly not looking his friend in the face he never looked any one in the face what a great pity it is that there are no people in our town who are capable of carrying on intelligent and interesting conversation or care to do so it is an immense privation for us even the educated class do not rise above vulgarity the level of their development i assure you is not a bit higher than that of the lower orders perfectly true i agree you know of course the doctor went on quietly and deliberately that everything in this world is insignificant and uninteresting except the higher spiritual manifestations of the human mind intellect draws a sharp line between the animals and man suggests the divinity of the latter and to some extent even takes the place of the immortality which does not exist consequently the intellect is the only possible source of enjoyment we see and hear of no trace of intellect about us so we are deprived of enjoyment we have books it is true but that is not at all the same as living talk and converse if you will allow me to make a not quite apt comparison books are the printed score while talk is the singing perfectly true a silence would follow daryushka would come out of the kitchen and with an expression of blank dejection would stand in the doorway to listen with her face propped on her fist eh mikhail avryanitch would sigh to expect intelligence of this generation and he would describe how wholesome entertaining and interesting life had been in the past how intelligent the educated class in russia used to be and what lofty ideas it had of honour and friendship how they used to lend money without an i o u and it was thought a disgrace not to give a helping hand to a comrade in need and what campaigns what adventures what skirmishes what comrades what women in the caucasus what a marvellous country the wife of a battalion commander a queer woman used to put on an officer's uniform and drive off into the mountains in the evening alone without a guide 
it was said that she had a love affair with some princeling in the native village queen of heaven holy mother daryushka would sigh and how we drank and how we ate and what desperate liberals we were andrey yefimitch would listen without hearing he was musing as he sipped his tea i often dream of intellectual people in conversation with them he said suddenly interrupting mikhail avrianitch my father gave me an excellent education but under the influence of the ideas of the sixties made me become a doctor i believe if i had not obeyed him then by now i should have been in the very centre of the intellectual movement most likely i should have become a member of some university of course intellect too is transient and not eternal but you know why i cherish a partiality for it life is a vexatious trap when a thinking man reaches maturity and attains to full consciousness he cannot help feeling that he is in a trap from which there is no escape indeed he is summoned without his choice by fortuitous circumstances from non-existence into life what for he tries to find out the meaning and object of his existence he is told nothing or he is told absurdities he knocks and it is not open to him death comes to him also without his choice and so just as in prison men held together by common misfortune feel more at ease when they are together so one does not notice the trap in life when people with a bent for analysis and generalization meet together and pass their time in the interchange of proud and free ideas in that sense the intellect is a source of an enjoyment nothing can replace perfectly true not looking his friend in the face andrey yefimitch would go on quietly and with pauses talking about intellectual people in conversation with them and mikhail avrianitch would listen attentively and agree perfectly true and you do not believe in the immortality of the soul he would ask suddenly no honoured mikhail avrianitch i do not believe it and have no grounds for believing it i must own i doubt it too and yet i have a feeling as though i should never die oh i think to myself old fogey it is time you were dead but there is a little voice in my soul says don't believe it you won't die soon after nine o'clock mikhail avrianitch would go away as he put on his fur coat in the entry he would say with a sigh what a wilderness fate has carried us to though really what's most vexatious of all is to have to die here Ech. End of chapter 6. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapters 7 and 8 of Ward No. 6 by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 7 After seeing his friend out, Andrey Yefimitch would sit down at the table and begin reading again. The stillness of the evening and afterwards of the night was not broken by a single sound, and it seemed as though time were standing still and brooding with the doctor over the book, and as though there were nothing in existence but the books and the lamp with the green shade the doctor's coarse peasant-like face was gradually lighted up by a smile of delight and enthusiasm over the progress of the human intellect oh why is not man immortal he thought what is the good of the brain centres and convolutions what is the good of sight speech self-consciousness genius if it is all destined to depart into the soil and in the end to grow cold together with the earth's crust and then for millions of years to fly with the earth round the sun with no meaning and no object to do that there was no need at all to draw a man with his lofty almost godlike intellect out of non-existence and then as though in mockery to turn him into clay the transmutation of substances but what cowardice to comfort oneself with that cheap substitute for immortality the unconscious processes that take place in nature are lower even than the stupidity of man since in stupidity there is anyway consciousness and will while in those processes there is absolutely nothing only the coward who has more fear of death than dignity can comfort himself with the fact that his body will in time live again in the grass in the stones in the toad to find one immortality in the transmutation of substances 
is as strange as to prophesy a brilliant future for the case after a precious violin has been broken and become useless when the clock struck andrey yefimitch would sink back into his chair and close his eyes to think a little and under the influence of the fine ideas of which he had been reading he would unawares recall his past and his present the past was hateful better not to think of it and it was the same in the present as in the past he knew that at the very time when his thoughts were floating together with the cooling earth round the sun in the main building beside his abode people were suffering in sickness and physical impurity someone perhaps could not sleep and was making war upon the insects someone was being infected by erysipelas or moaning over too tight a bandage perhaps the patients were playing cards with the nurses and drinking vodka according to the yearly return twelve thousand people had been deceived the whole hospital rested as it had done twenty years ago on thieving filth scandals gossip on gross quackery and as before it was an immoral institution extremely injurious to the health of the inhabitants he knew that nikita knocked the patients about behind the barred windows of ward number six and that moiseika went about the town every day begging alms on the other hand he knew very well that a magical change had taken place in medicine during the last twenty-five years when he was studying at the university he had fancied that medicine would soon be overtaken by the fate of alchemy and metaphysics but now when he was reading at night the science of medicine touched him and excited his wonder and even enthusiasm what unexpected brilliance what a revolution thanks to the antiseptic system operations were performed such as the great pirogov had considered impossible even in spay ordinarily zemstvo doctors were venturing to perform the resection of the kneecap of abdominal operations only one per cent was fatal while stone was considered such a trifle that they did not even write about it a radical cure for syphilis had been discovered and the theory of heredity hypnotism the discoveries of pasteur and of koch hygiene based on statistics and the work of zemstvo doctors psychiatry with its modern classification of mental diseases methods of diagnosis and treatment was a perfect elborus in comparison with what had been in the past they no longer poured cold water on the heads of lunatics nor put straight waistcoats upon them they treated them with humanity and even so it was stated in the papers got up balls and entertainments for them andrey yefimitch knew that with modern tastes and views such an abomination as ward number six was possible only a hundred and fifty miles from a railway in a little town where the mayor and all the town council were half illiterate tradesmen who looked upon the doctor as an oracle who must be believed without any criticism even if he had poured molten lead into their mouths in any other place the public and the newspapers would long ago have torn this little bastille to pieces but after all what of it andrey yefimitch would ask himself opening his eyes there is the antiseptic system there is koch there is pasteur but the essential reality is not altered a bit ill health and mortality are still the same they get up balls and entertainments for the mad but still they don't let them go free so it's all nonsense and vanity and there is no difference in reality between the best vienna clinic and my hospital but depression and a feeling akin to envy prevented him from feeling indifferent it must have been owing to exhaustion his heavy head sank on to the book he put his hands under his face to make it softer and thought i serve in a pernicious institution and receive a salary from people whom i am deceiving i am not honest but then i of myself am nothing i am only part of an inevitable social evil all local officials are pernicious and receive their salary for doing nothing and so for my dishonesty it is not i who am to blame but the times if i had been born two hundred years later i should have been different when it struck three he would put out his lamp and go into his bedroom he was not sleepy chapter eight two years before the zemstvo in a liberal mood had decided to allow three hundred roubles a year to pay for additional medical service in the town till the zemstvo hospital shall be opened and the district doctor yevgeny fyodoritch hobotov was invited to the town to assist andrey yefimitch he was a very young man not yet thirty tall and dark 
with broad cheekbones and little eyes. His forefathers had probably come from one of the many alien races of Russia. He arrived in the town without a farthing, with a small portmanteau and a plain young woman whom he called his cook. This woman had a baby at the breast. Yevgeny Fyodoritch used to go about in a cap with a peak and in high boots, and in the winter wore a sheepskin. He made great friends with Sergei Sergeyitch, the medical assistant, and with the treasurer, but held aloof from the other officials, and for some reason called them aristocrats. He had only one book in his lodgings, the latest prescriptions of the Vienna Clinic for 1881. When he went to a patient, he always took this book with him. He played billiards in the evening at the club. He did not like cards. He was very fond of using in conversation such expressions as endless bobbery, canting soft soap, shut up with your finicking. He visited the hospital twice a week, made the round of the wards, and saw outpatients. The complete absence of antiseptic treatment and the cupping roused his indignation, but he did not introduce any new system, being afraid of offending Andrey Yefimitch. He regarded his colleague as a sly old rascal, suspected him of being a man of large means, and secretly envied him. He would have been very glad to have his post. End of chapter 8 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 9 of Ward Number 6 by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 9 On a spring evening towards the end of March, when there was no snow left on the ground, and the starlings were singing in the hospital garden, the doctor went out to see his friend the postmaster as far as the gate. At that very moment, the Jew Moiseka, returning with his booty, came into the yard. He had no cap on, and his bare feet were thrust into galoshes. In his hand, he had a little bag of coppers. Give me a kopeck, he said to the doctor, smiling and shivering with cold. Andrey Yefimitch, who could never refuse anyone anything, gave him a ten kopeck piece. How bad that is, he thought looking at the jews bare feet with their thin red ankles why it's wet and stirred by a feeling akin both to pity and disgust he went into the lodge behind the jew looking now at his bald head now at his ankles as the doctor went in nikita jumped up from his heap of litter and stood at attention good day nikita andrey yefimitch said mildly that jew should be provided with boots or something he will catch cold certainly your honour i'll inform the superintendent please do ask him in my name tell him that i asked the door into the ward was open ivan dmitritch lying propped on his elbow on the bed listened in alarm to the unfamiliar voice and suddenly recognized the doctor he trembled all over with anger jumped up and with a red and wrathful face with his eyes starting out of his head ran out into the middle of the road the doctor has come he shouted and broke into a laugh at last gentlemen i congratulate you the doctor is honouring us with a visit cursed reptile he shrieked and stamped in a frenzy such as had never been seen in the ward before kill the reptile no killing's too good drown him in the midden pit andrey yefimitch hearing this looked into the ward from the entry and asked gently what for what for shouted ivan dmitritch going up to him with a menacing air and convulsively wrapping himself in his dressing-gown what for thief he said with a look of repulsion moving his lips as though he would spit at him quack hangman calm yourself said andrey yefimitch smiling guiltily i assure you i have never stolen anything and as to the rest most likely you greatly exaggerate i can see you are angry with me calm yourself i beg if you can and tell me coolly what are you angry for what are you keeping me here for because you are ill yes i am ill but you know dozens hundreds of madmen are walking about in freedom because your ignorance is incapable of distinguishing them from the sane why am i and these poor wretches to be shut up here like scapegoats for all the rest you your assistant the superintendent and all your hospital rabble 
are immeasurably inferior to every one of us morally why then are we shut up and you not where is the logic of it morality and logic don't come in it all depends on chance if any one is shut up he has to stay and if any one is not shut up he can walk about that's all there is neither morality nor logic in my being a doctor and your being a mental patient there is nothing but idle chance that twaddle i don't understand ivan dmitritch brought out in a hollow voice and he sat down on his bed moiseka whom nikita did not venture to search in the presence of the doctor laid out on his bed pieces of bread bits of paper and little bones and still shivering with cold began rapidly in a sing-song voice saying something in yiddish he most likely imagined that he had opened a shop let me out said ivan dmitritch and his voice quivered i cannot but why why because it is not in my power think what use will it be to you if i do let you out go the townspeople or the police will detain you or bring you back yes yes that's true said ivan dmitritch and he rubbed his forehead it's awful but what am i to do what andrey yefimitch liked ivan dmitritch's voice and his intelligent young face with its grimaces he longed to be kind to the young man and soothe him he sat down on the bed beside him thought and said you ask me what to do the very best thing in your position would be to run away but unhappily that is useless you would be taken up when society protects itself from the criminal mentally deranged or otherwise inconvenient people it is invincible there is only one thing left for you to resign yourself to the thought that your presence here is inevitable it is no use to any one so long as prisons and madhouses exist someone must be shut up in them if not you i if not i some third person wait until in the distant future prisons and madhouses no longer exist and there will be neither bars on the windows nor hospital gowns of course that time will come sooner or later ivan dmitritch smiled ironically you are jesting he said screwing up his eyes such gentlemen as you and your assistant nikita have nothing to do with the future but you may be sure sir better days will come i may express myself cheaply you may laugh but the dawn of a new life is at hand truth and justice will triumph and our turn will come i shall not live to see it i shall perish but some people's great-grandsons will see it i greet them with all my heart and rejoice rejoice with them onward god be your help friends with shining eyes ivan dmitritch got up and stretching his hands towards the window went on with emotion in his voice from behind these bars i bless you hurrah for truth and justice i rejoice i see no particular reason to rejoice said andrey yefimitch who thought ivan dmitritch's movement theatrical though he was delighted by it prisons and madhouses there will not be and truth as you have just expressed it will triumph but the reality of things you know will not change the laws of nature will still remain the same people will suffer pain grow old and die just as they do now however magnificent a dawn lighted up your life you would yet in the end be nailed up in a coffin and thrown into a hole an immortality oh come now you don't believe in it but i do somebody in dostoevsky or voltaire said that if there had not been a god men would have invented him and i firmly believe that if there is no immortality the great intellect of man will sooner or later invent it well said observed andrey yefimitch smiling with pleasure it's a good thing you have faith with such a belief one may live happily even shut up within walls you have studied somewhere i presume yes i have been at the university but did not complete my studies you are reflecting and a thoughtful man in any surroundings you can find tranquillity in yourself free and deep thinking which strives for the comprehension of life and complete contempt for the foolish bustle of the world those are two blessings beyond any that man has ever known and you can possess them even though you live behind threefold bars diogenes lived in a tub yet he was happier than all the kings of the earth your diogenes was a blockhead said ivan dmitritch morosely why do you talk to me about diogenes and some foolish comprehension of life he cried growing suddenly angry and leaping up i love life i love it passionately i have the mania of persecution a continual agonizing terror but i have moments when i am overwhelmed by the thirst for life and then i am afraid of going mad i want dreadfully to live dreadfully 
he walked up and down the ward in agitation and said dropping his voice when i dream i am haunted by phantoms people come to me i hear voices and music and i fancy i am walking through woods or by the seashore and i long so passionately for movement for interests come tell me what news is there asked ivan dmitritch what's happening you wish to know about the town or in general well tell me first about the town and then in general well in the town it is appallingly dull there's no one to say a word to no one to listen to there are no new people a young doctor called hobotov has come here recently he had come in my time well he is a low cad isn't he yes he's a man of no culture it's strange you know judging by every sign there is no intellectual stagnation in our capital cities there is a movement so there must be real people there too but for some reason they always send us such men as i would rather not see it's an unlucky town yes it is an unlucky town sighed ivan dmitritch and he laughed and how are things in general what are they writing in the papers and reviews it was by now dark in the ward the doctor got up and standing began to describe what was being written abroad and in russia and the tendency of thought that could be noticed now ivan dmitritch listened attentively and put questions but suddenly as though recalling something terrible clutched at his head and lay down on the bed with his back to the doctor what's the matter asked andrey yefimitch you will not hear another word from me said ivan dmitritch rudely leave me alone why so i tell you leave me alone why the devil do you persist andrey yefimitch shrugged his shoulders heaved a sigh and went out as he crossed the entry he said you might clear up here nikita there's an awfully stuffy smell oh, certainly your honour what an agreeable young man thought andrey yefimitch going back to his flat in all the years i've been living here i do believe he's the first i've met with whom one can talk he is capable of reasoning and is interested in just the right things while he was reading and afterwards while he was going to bed he kept thinking about ivan dmitritch and when he woke next morning he remembered that he had the day before made the acquaintance of an interesting and intelligent man and determined to visit him again as soon as possible end of chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Ten of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Ten. Ivan Dmitritch was lying in the same position as on the previous day, with his head clutched in both hands and his legs drawn up. His face was not visible good day my friend said andrey yefimitch you're not asleep are you in the first place i am not your friend ivan dmitritch articulated into the pillow and in the second your efforts are useless you will not get one word out of me strange muttered andrey yefimitch in confusion yesterday we talked peacefully but suddenly for some reason you took offence and broke off all at once probably i expressed myself awkwardly or perhaps gave utterance to some idea which did not fit in with your convictions yes a likely idea said ivan dmitritch sitting up and looking at the doctor with irony and uneasiness his eyes were red you can go and spy and probe somewhere else it's no use your doing it here i knew yesterday what you had come for a strange fancy laughed the doctor so you suppose me to be a spy yes i do a spy or a doctor who has been charged to test me it's all the same oh excuse me what a queer fellow you are really the doctor sat down on the stool near the bed and shook his head reproachfully but let us suppose you are right he said let us suppose that i am treacherously trying to trap you into saying something so as to betray you to the police you would be arrested and then tried but would you be any worse off being tried and in prison than you are here if you are banished to a settlement or even sent to penal servitude would it be worse than being shut up in this ward i imagine it would be no worse what then are you afraid of these words evidently had an effect on ivan dmitritch he sat down quietly it was between four and five in the afternoon the time when andrey yefimitch usually walked up and down his rooms 
and daryushka asked whether it was not time for his beer it was a still bright day i came out for a walk after dinner and here i have come as you see said the doctor it is quite spring what month is it march asked ivan dmitritch yes the end of march is it very muddy no not very there are already paths in the garden it would be nice now to drive in an open carriage somewhere into the country said ivan dmitritch rubbing his red eyes as though he were just awake and then to come home to a warm snug study and then to have a decent doctor to cure one's headache it's so long since i have lived like a human being it's disgusting here insufferably disgusting after his excitement of the previous day he was exhausted and listless and spoke unwillingly his fingers twitched and from his face it could be seen that he had a splitting headache there is no real difference between a warm snug study and this ward said andrey yefimitch a man's peace and contentment do not lie outside a man but in himself what do you mean the ordinary man looks for good and evil in external things that is in carriages in studies but a thinking man looks for it in himself you should go and preach that philosophy in greece where it's warm and fragrant with the scent of pomegranates but here it is not suited to the climate with whom was it i was talking of diogenes was it with you yes with me yesterday diogenes did not need a study or a warm habitation it's hot there without you can lie in your tub and eat oranges and olives but bring him to russia to live he'd be begging to be let indoors in may let alone december he'd be doubled up with the cold no one can be insensible to cold as to every other pain marcus aurelius says a pain is a vivid idea of pain make an effort of will to change that idea dismiss it cease to complain and the pain will disappear that is true the wise man or simply the reflecting thoughtful man is distinguished precisely by his contempt for suffering he is always contented and surprised at nothing then i am an idiot since i suffer and am discontented and surprised at the baseness of mankind you are wrong in that if you will reflect more on the subject you will understand how insignificant is all that external world that agitates us one must strive for the comprehension of life and in that is true happiness comprehension repeated ivan dmitritch frowning external internal excuse me but i don't understand it i only know he said getting up and looking angrily at the doctor i only know that god has created me of warm blood and nerves yes indeed if organic tissue is capable of life it must react to every stimulus and i do to pain i respond with tears and outcries to baseness with indignation to filth with loathing to my mind that is just what is called life the lower the organism the less sensitive it is and the more feebly it reacts to stimulus and the higher it is the more responsibly and vigorously it reacts to reality how is it you don't know that a doctor and not know such trifles to despise suffering to be always contented and to be surprised at nothing one must reach this condition and ivan dmitritch pointed to the peasant who was a mass of fat or to harden oneself by suffering to such a point that one loses all sensibility to it that is in other words to cease to live you must excuse me i am not a sage or a philosopher ivan dmitritch continued with irritation and i don't understand anything about it i am not capable of reasoning on the contrary your reasoning is excellent the stoics whom you are parodying were remarkable people but their doctrine crystallized two thousand years ago and has not advanced and will not advance an inch forward since it is not practical or living it had a success only with the minority which spends its life in savouring all sorts of theories and ruminating over them the majority did not understand it a doctrine which advocates indifference to wealth and to the comforts of life and a contempt for suffering and death is quite unintelligible to the vast majority of men since that majority has never known wealth or the comforts of life and to despise suffering would mean to it despising life itself since the whole existence of man is made up of the sensations of hunger cold injury and a hamlet-like dread of death the whole of life lies in these sensations one may be oppressed by it one may hate it but one cannot despise it yes so i repeat the doctrine of the stoics can never have a future 
from the beginning of time up to today you see continually increasing the struggle the sensibility to pain the capacity of responding to stimulus ivan dmitritch suddenly lost the thread of his thoughts stopped and rubbed his forehead with vexation i meant to say something important but i have lost it he said what was i saying oh yes this is what i mean one of the stoics sold himself into slavery to redeem his neighbor so you see even a stoic did react to stimulus since for such a generous act as the destruction of oneself for the sake of one's neighbor he must have had a soul capable of pity and indignation here in prison i have forgotten everything i have learned or else i could have recalled something else take christ for instance christ responded to reality by weeping smiling being sorrowful and moved to wrath even overcome by misery he did not go to meet his sufferings with a smile he did not despise death but prayed in the garden of gethsemane that this cup might pass him by ivan dmitritch laughed and sat down granted that a man's peace and contentment lie not outside but in himself he said granted that one must despise suffering and not be surprised at anything yet on what ground do you preach the theory are you a sage a philosopher no i am not a philosopher but every one ought to preach it because it is reasonable no i want to know how it is that you consider yourself competent to judge of comprehension contempt for suffering and so on have you ever suffered have you any idea of suffering allow me to ask you were you ever thrashed in your childhood no my parents had an aversion for corporal punishment my father used to flog me cruelly my father was a harsh sickly government clerk with a long nose and a yellow neck but let us talk of you no one has laid a finger on you all your life no one has scared you nor beaten you you are as strong as a bull you grew up under your father's wing and studied at his expense and then you dropped at once into a sinecure for more than twenty years you have lived rent-free with heating lighting and service all provided and had the right to work how you pleased and as much as you pleased even to do nothing you were naturally a flabby lazy man and so you have tried to arrange your life so that nothing should disturb you or make you move you have handed over your work to the assistant and the rest of the rabble while you sit in peace and warmth save money read amuse yourself with reflections with all sorts of lofty nonsense and ivan dmitritch looked at the doctor's red nose with boozing in fact you have seen nothing of life you know absolutely nothing of it and are only theoretically acquainted with reality you despise suffering and are surprised at nothing for a very simple reason vanity of vanities the external and the internal contempt for life for suffering and for death comprehension true happiness that's the philosophy that suits the russian sluggard best you see a peasant beating his wife for instance why interfere let him beat her they will both die sooner or later anyway and besides he who beats injures by his blows not the person he is beating but himself to get drunk is stupid and unseemly but if you drink you die and if you don't drink you die a peasant woman comes with toothache well what of it pain is the idea of pain and besides there is no living in this world without illness we shall all die and so go away woman don't hinder me from thinking and drinking vodka a young man asks advice what he is to do how he is to live any one else would think before answering but you have got the answer ready strive for comprehension or for true happiness and what is that fantastic true happiness there is no answer of course we are kept here behind barred windows tortured left to rot but that is very good and reasonable because there is no difference at all between this ward and a warm snug study a convenient philosophy you can do nothing and your conscience is clear and you feel you are wise no sir it is not philosophy it's not thinking it's not breadth of vision but laziness fakirism drowsy stupefaction yes cried ivan dmitritch getting angry again you despise suffering but i'll be bound if you pinch your finger in the door you will howl at the top of your voice and perhaps i shouldn't howl said andrey yefimitch with a gentle smile oh i dare say well if you had a stroke of paralysis or supposing some fool or bully took advantage of his position and rank to insult you in public and if you knew he could do it with impunity 
then you would understand what it means to put people off with comprehension and true happiness that's original said andrey yefimitch laughing with pleasure and rubbing his hands i am agreeably struck by your inclination for drawing generalizations and the sketch of my character you have just drawn is simply brilliant i must confess that talking to you gives me great pleasure well i've listened to you and now you must graciously listen to me End of chapter 10. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapters 11 and 12 of Ward No. 6 by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 11 The conversation went on for about an hour longer, and apparently made a deep impression on Andrey Yefimitch. He began going to the ward every day. He went there in the mornings and after dinner, and often the dusk of an evening found him in conversation with Ivan Dmitritch. At first Ivan Dmitritch held aloof from him, suspected him of evil designs and openly expressed his hostility but afterwards he got used to him and his abrupt manner changed to one of condescending irony soon it was all over the hospital that the doctor andrey yefimitch had taken to visiting ward number six no one neither sergey sergeyevitch nor nikita nor the nurses could conceive why he went there why he stayed there for hours together what he was talking about and why he did not write prescriptions his actions seemed strange. Often Mikhail Avrianitch did not find him at home, which had never happened in the past, and Daryushka was greatly perturbed, for the doctor drank his beer now at no definite time, and sometimes was even late for dinner. One day, it was at the end of June, Dr. Hobotov went to see Andrey Yefimitch about something. Not finding him at home, he proceeded to look for him in the yard. There he was told that the old doctor had gone to see the mental patients. Going into the lodge and stopping in the entry, Hobotov heard the following conversation. We shall never agree, and you will not succeed in converting me to your faith, Ivan Dmitritch was saying irritably. You are utterly ignorant of reality, and you have never known suffering, but have only like a leech fed beside the suffering of others, while I have been in continual suffering from the day of my birth till today. For that reason, I tell you frankly, I consider myself superior to you and more competent in every respect it's not for you to teach me i have absolutely no ambition to convert you to my faith said andrey yefimitch gently and with regret that the other refused to understand him and that is not what matters my friend what matters is not that you have suffered and i have not joy and suffering are passing let us leave them never mind them what matters is that you and i think we see in each other people who are capable of thinking and reasoning and that is a common bond between us, however different our views. If you knew, my friend, how sick I am of the universal senselessness, ineptitude, stupidity, and with what delight I always talk with you. You are an intelligent man, and I enjoyed your company. Hobotov opened the door an inch and glanced into the ward. Ivan Dmitritch in his nightcap and the doctor Andrey Yefimitch were sitting side by side on the bed the madman was grimacing twitching and convulsively wrapping himself in his gown while the doctor sat motionless with bowed head and his face was red and looked helpless and sorrowful hobotov shrugged his shoulders grinned and glanced at nikita nikita shrugged his shoulders too next day hobotov went to the lodge accompanied by the assistant both stood in the entry and listened i fancy our old man has gone clean off his chump said hobotov as he came out of the lodge lord have mercy upon us sinners sighed the decorous sergey sergeyitch scrupulously avoiding the puddles that he might not muddy his polished boots i must own honoured yevgeny fyodoritch i have been expecting it for a long time chapter twelve after this andrey yefimitch began to notice a mysterious air in all around him the attendants the nurses and the patients looked at him inquisitively when they met him and then whispered together the superintendent's little daughter masha whom he liked to meet in the hospital garden for some reason ran away from him now when he went up with a smile to stroke her on the head 
the postmaster no longer said perfectly true as he listened to him but in unaccountable confusion muttered yes 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 and looked at him with a grieved and thoughtful expression for some reason he took to advising his friend to give up vodka and beer but as a man of delicate feeling he did not say this directly but hinted it telling him first about the commanding officer of his battalion an excellent man and then about the priest of the regiment a capital fellow both of whom drank and fell ill but on giving up drinking completely regained their health on two or three occasions andrey yefimitch was visited by his colleague hobotov who also advised him to give up spirituous liquors and for no apparent reason recommended him to take bromide in august andrey yefimitch got a letter from the mayor of the town asking him to come on very important business on arriving at the town hall at the time fixed andrey yefimitch found there the military commander the superintendent of the district school a member of the town council hobotov and a plump fair gentleman who was introduced to him as a doctor this doctor with a polish surname difficult to pronounce lived at a pedigree stud farm twenty miles away and was now on a visit to the town there's something that concerns you said the member of the town council addressing andrey yefimitch after they had all greeted one another and sat down to the table here yevgeny fyodoritch says that there is not room for the dispensary in the main building and that it ought to be transferred to one of the lodges that's of no consequence of course it can be transferred but the point is that the lodge wants doing up yes it would have to be done up said andrey yefimitch after a moment's thought if the corner lodge for instance were fitted up as a dispensary i imagine it would cost at least five hundred roubles an unproductive expenditure everyone was silent for a space i had the honour of submitting to you ten years ago andrey yefimitch went on in a low voice that the hospital in its present form is a luxury for the town beyond its means it was built in the forties but things were different then the town spends too much on unnecessary buildings and superfluous staff i believe with a different system two model hospitals might be maintained for the same money well let us have a different system then the member of the town council said briskly i have already had the honour of submitting to you that the medical department should be transferred to the supervision of the zemspo yes transfer the money to the zemspo and they will steal it laughed the fair-haired doctor that's what it always comes to the member of the council assented and he also laughed andrey yefimitch looked with apathetic lustreless eyes at the fair-haired doctor and said one should be just again there was silence tea was brought in the military commander for some reason much embarrassed touched andrey yefimitch's hand across the table and said you have quite forgotten us doctor but of course you are a hermit you don't play cards and don't like women you would be dull with fellows like us they all began saying how boring it was for a decent person to live in such a town no theatre no music and at the last dance at the club there had been about twenty ladies and only two gentlemen the young men did not dance but spent all the time crowding round the refreshment bar or playing cards not looking at any one and speaking slowly in a low voice andrey yefimitch began saying what a pity what a terrible pity it was that the townspeople should waste their vital energy their hearts and their minds on cards and gossip and should have neither the power nor the inclination to spend their time in interesting conversation and reading and should refuse to take advantage of the enjoyments of the mind the mind alone was interesting and worthy of attention all the rest was low and petty hobotov listened to his colleague attentively and suddenly asked andrey yefimitch what day of the month is it having received an answer the fair-haired doctor and he in the tone of examiners conscious of their lack of skill began asking andrey yefimitch what was the day of the week how many days there were in the year and whether it was true that there was a remarkable prophet living in ward number six in response to the last question andrey yefimitch turned rather red and said yes he is mentally deranged but he is an interesting young man they asked him no other questions when he was putting on his overcoat in the entry the military commander laid a hand on his shoulder and said with a sigh it's time for us old fellows to rest as he came out of the hall andrey yefimitch understood that it had been a committee appointed to inquire into his mental condition he recalled the questions that had been asked him flushed crimson and for some reason for the first time in his life felt bitterly grieved for medical science 
my god he thought remembering how these doctors had just examined him why they have only lately been hearing lectures on mental pathology they had passed an examination what's the explanation of this crass ignorance they have not a conception of mental pathology and for the first time in his life he felt insulted and moved to anger in the evening of the same day mikhail averyanitch came to see him the postman went up to him without waiting to greet him took him by both hands and said in an agitated voice my dear fellow my dear friend show me that you believe in my genuine affection and look on me as your friend and preventing andrey yefimitch from speaking he went on growing excited i love you for your culture and nobility of soul listen to me my dear fellow the rules of their profession compel the doctors to conceal the truth from you but i blurt out the plain truth like a soldier you are not well excuse me my dear fellow but it is the truth every one about you has been noticing it for a long time dr yevgeny fyodoritch has just told me that it is essential for you to rest and distract your mind for the sake of your health perfectly true excellent in a day or two i am taking a holiday and am going away for a sniff of a different atmosphere show that you are a friend to me let us go together let us go for a jaunt as in the good old days i feel perfectly well said andrey yefimitch after a moment's thought i can't go away allow me to show you my friendship in some other way to go off with no object without his books without his daryushka without his beer to break abruptly through the routine of life established for twenty years the idea for the first minute struck him as wild and fantastic but he remembered the conversation at the zemstvo committee and the depressing feelings with which he had returned home and the thought of a brief absence from the town in which stupid people looked on him as a madman was pleasant to him and where precisely do you intend to go he asked to moscow to petersburg to warsaw i spent the five happiest years of my life in warsaw what a marvellous town let us go my dear fellow end of chapter twelve Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapters 13 and 14 of Ward No. 6 by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 13 A week later it was suggested to Andrey Yefimitch that he should have a rest, that is, send in his resignation, a suggestion he received with indifference, and a week later still, Mikhail Averyanitch and he were sitting in a posting carriage driving to the nearest railway station. The days were cool and bright, with a blue sky and a transparent distance. They were two days driving the hundred and fifty miles to the railway station, and stayed two nights on the way, when at the posting station the glasses given them for their tea had not been properly washed, or the drivers were slow in harnessing the horses, Mikhail Avryanitch would turn crimson, and quivering all over would shout, Hold your tongue, don't argue! And in the carriage he talked without ceasing for a moment, describing his campaigns in the Caucasus and in Poland what adventures he had had what meetings he talked loudly and opened his eyes so wide with wonder that he might well be thought to be lying moreover as he talked he breathed in andrey yefimitch's face and laughed into his ear this bothered the doctor and prevented him from thinking or concentrating his mind in the train they travelled from motives of economy third class in a non-smoking compartment half the passengers were decent people mikhail avryanitch soon made friends with everyone and moving from one seat to another kept saying loudly that they ought not to travel by these appalling lines it was a regular swindle a very different thing riding on a good horse one could do over seventy miles a day and feel fresh and well after it and our bad harvests were due to the draining of the pinsk marshes altogether the way things were done was dreadful he got excited talked loudly and would not let others speak this endless chatter to the accompaniment of loud laughter and expressive gestures wearied andrey yefimitch which of us is the madman he thought with vexation i who try not to disturb my fellow-passengers in any way or this egoist who thinks that he is cleverer and more interesting than any one here and so will leave no one in peace in moscow mikhail averyanitch put on a military coat 
without epaulettes and trousers with red braid on them he wore a military cap and overcoat in the street and soldiers saluted him it seemed to andrey yefimitch now that his companion was a man who had flung away all that was good and kept only what was bad of all the characteristics of a country gentleman that he had once possessed he liked to be waited on even when it was quite unnecessary the matches would be lying before him on the table and he would see them and shout to the waiter to give him the matches he did not hesitate to appear before a maid-servant in nothing but his underclothes he used the familiar mode of address to all footmen indiscriminately even old men and when he was angry called them fools and blockheads this andrey yefimitch thought was like a gentleman but disgusting first of all mihail averyanitch led his friend to the iversky madonna he prayed fervently shedding tears and bowing down to the earth and when he had finished heaved a deep sigh and said even though one does not believe it makes one somehow easier when one prays a little kiss the icon my dear fellow andrey yefimitch was embarrassed and he kissed the image while mihail avryanitch pursed up his lips and prayed in a whisper and again tears came into his eyes then they went to the kremlin and looked there at the tsar cannon and the tsar bell and even touched them with their fingers admired the view over the river visited st saviour's and the rumyatsov museum they dined at tyatsov's mihail avryanitch looked a long time at the menu stroking his whiskers and said in the tone of a gourmand accustomed to eat in restaurants we shall see what you give us to eat to-day angel chapter fourteen the doctor walked about looked at things ate and drank but he had all the while one feeling annoyance with mihail averyanitch he longed to have a rest from his friend to get away from him to hide himself while the friend thought it was his duty not to let the doctor move a step away from him and to provide him with as many distractions as possible when there was nothing to look at he entertained him with conversation for two days andrey yefimitch endured it but on the third he announced to his friend that he was ill and wanted to stay at home for the whole day his friend replied that in that case he would stay too that really he needed rest for he was run off his legs already andrey yefimitch lay on the sofa with his face to the back and clenching his teeth listened to his friend who assured him with heat that sooner or later france would certainly thrash germany that there were a great many scoundrels in moscow and that it was impossible to judge of a horse's quality by its outward appearance the doctor began to have a buzzing in his ears and palpitations of the heart but out of delicacy could not bring himself to beg his friend to go away or hold his tongue fortunately mihail averyanitch grew weary of sitting in the hotel room and after dinner he went out for a walk as soon as he was alone andrey yefimitch abandoned himself to a feeling of relief how pleasant to lie motionless on the sofa and to know that one is alone in the room real happiness is impossible without solitude the fallen angel betrayed god probably because he longed for solitude of which the angels know nothing andrey yefimitch wanted to think about what he had seen and heard during the last few days but he could not get mihail avryanitch out of his head why he has taken a holiday and come with me out of friendship out of generosity thought the doctor with vexation nothing could be worse than this friendly supervision i suppose he is good-natured and generous and a lively fellow but he is a bore an insufferable bore in the same way there are people who never say anything but what is clever and good yet one feels that they are dull-witted people for the following days andrey yefimitch declared himself ill and would not leave the hotel room he lay with his face to the back of the sofa and suffered agonies of weariness when his friend entertained him with conversation or rested when his friend was absent he was vexed with himself for having come and with his friend who grew every day more talkative and more free and easy he could not succeed in attuning his thoughts to a serious and lofty level this is what i get from the real life ivan dmitritch talked about he thought angry at his own pettiness it's of no consequence though i shall go home and everything will go on as before it was the same thing in petersburg too for whole days together he did not leave the hotel room but lay on the sofa and only got up to drink beer mihail avryanitch was all haste to get to warsaw my dear man what should i go there for said andrey yefimitch in an imploring voice you go alone and let me get home i entreat you 
on no account protested mihail avrianitch it's a marvellous town andrey yefimitch had not the strength of will to insist on his own way and much against his inclination went to warsaw there he did not leave the hotel room but lay on the sofa furious with himself with his friend and with the waiters who obstinately refused to understand russian while mihail avrianitch healthy hearty and full of spirits as usual went about the town from morning to night looking for his old acquaintances several times he did not return home at night after one night spent in some unknown haunt he returned home early in the morning in a violently excited condition with a red face and tousled hair for a long time he walked up and down the rooms muttering something to himself then stopped and said honour before everything after walking up and down a little longer he clutched his head in both hands and pronounced in a tragic voice yes honour before everything accursed be the moment when the idea first entered my head to visit this babylon my dear friend he added addressing the doctor you may despise me i have played and lost lend me five hundred roubles andrey yefimitch counted out five hundred roubles and gave them to his friend without a word the latter still crimson with shame and anger incoherently articulated some useless vow put on his cap and went out returning two hours later he flopped into an easy chair heaved a loud sigh and said my honour is saved let us go my friends i do not care to remain another hour in this accursed town scoundrels austrian spies by the time the friends were back in their own town it was november and deep snow was lying in the streets dr hobomov had andrey yefimitch's post he was still living in his old lodgings waiting for andrey yefimitch to arrive and clear out of the hospital apartments the plain woman whom he called his cook was already established in one of the lodges fresh scandals about the hospital were going the round of the town it was said that the plain woman had quarrelled with the superintendent and that the latter had crawled on his knees before her begging forgiveness on the first day he arrived andrey yefimitch had to look out for lodgings my friend the postmaster said to him timidly excuse an indiscreet question what means have you at your disposal andrey yefimitch without a word counted out his money and said eighty-six roubles i don't mean that mihail avrianitch brought out in confusion misunderstanding him i mean what have you to live on i tell you eighty-six roubles i have nothing else Mikhail Avrianitch looked upon the doctor as an honourable man, yet he suspected that he had accumulated a fortune of at least twenty thousand. Now learning that Andrey Yefimitch was a beggar, that he had nothing to live on, he was for some reason suddenly moved to tears and embraced his friend. End of chapter 14 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter Fifteen of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Fifteen. Andrey Yefimitch now lodged in a little house with three windows. There were only three rooms besides the kitchen in the little house. The doctor lived in two of them, which looked into the street while daryushka and the landlady with her three children lived in the third room in the kitchen sometimes the landlady's lover a drunken peasant who was rowdy and reduced the children and daryushka to terror would come for the night when he arrived and established himself in the kitchen and demanded vodka they all felt very uncomfortable and the doctor would be moved by pity to take the crying children into his room and let them lie on his floor and this gave him great satisfaction he got up as before at eight o'clock and after his morning tea sat down to read his old books and magazines he had no money for new ones either because the books were old or perhaps because of the change in his surroundings reading exhausted him and did not grip his attention as before that he might not spend his time in idleness he made a detailed catalogue of his books and gummed little labels on their backs and this mechanical tedious work seemed to him more interesting than reading the monotonous tedious work lulled his thoughts to sleep in some unaccountable way and the time passed quickly while he thought of nothing 
even sitting in the kitchen peeling potatoes with daryushka or picking over the buckwheat grain seemed to him interesting on saturdays and sundays he went to church standing near the wall and half closing his eyes he listened to the singing and thought of his father of his mother of the university of the religions of the world he felt calm and melancholy and as he went out of the church afterwards he regretted that the service was so soon over he went twice to the hospital to talk to ivan dmitritch but on both occasions ivan dmitritch was unusually excited and ill-humoured he bade the doctor leave him in peace as he had long been sick of empty chatter and declared to make up for all his sufferings he asked from the damned scoundrels only one favour solitary confinement surely they would not refuse him even that on both occasions when andrey yefimitch was taking leave of him and wishing him good-night he answered rudely and said go to hell and andrey yefimitch did not know now whether to go to him for the third time or not he longed to go in old days andrey yefimitch used to walk about his rooms and think in the interval after dinner but now from dinner time till evening tea he lay on the sofa with his face to the back and gave himself up to trivial thoughts which he could not struggle against he was mortified that after more than twenty years of service he had been given neither a pension nor any assistance it is true that he had not done his work honestly but then all who are in the service get a pension without distinction whether they are honest or not contemporary justice lies precisely in the bestowal of grades orders and pensions not for moral qualities or capacities but for service whatever it may have been like why was he alone to be an exception he had no money at all he was ashamed to pass by the shop and look at the woman who owned it he owed thirty-two roubles for beer already there was money owing to the landlady also daryushka sold old clothes and books on the sly and told lies to the landlady saying that the doctor was just going to receive a large sum of money he was angry with himself for having wasted on travelling the thousand roubles he had saved up how useful that thousand roubles would have been now he was vexed that people would not leave him in peace hobotov thought it his duty to look in on his sick colleague from time to time everything about him was revolting to andrey yefimitch his well-fed face and vulgar condescending tone and his use of the word colleague and his high top boots the most revolting thing was that he thought it was his duty to treat andrey yefimitch and thought that he really was treating him on every visit he brought a bottle of bromide and rhubarb pills mikhail avryanitch too thought it his duty to visit his friend and entertain him every time he went in to andrey yefimitch with an affectation of ease laughed constrainedly and began assuring him that he was looking very well to-day and that thank god he was on the high road to recovery and from this it might be concluded that he looked on his friend's condition as hopeless he had not yet repaid his warsaw debt and was overwhelmed by shame he was constrained and so tried to laugh louder and talk more amusingly his anecdotes and descriptions seemed endless now and were an agony both to andrey yefimitch and himself in his presence andrey yefimitch usually lay on the sofa with his face to the wall and listened with his teeth clenched his soul was oppressed with rankling disgust and after every visit from his friend he felt as though this disgust had risen higher and was mounting into his throat to stifle petty thoughts he made haste to reflect that he himself and hobotov and mikhail avryanitch would all sooner or later perish without leaving any trace on the world if one imagines some spirit flying by the earthly globe in space in a million years he would see nothing but clay and bare rocks everything culture and the moral law would pass away and not even a burdock would grow out of them of what consequence was shame in the presence of a shopkeeper of what consequence was the insignificant hobotov or the wearisome friendship of mikhail avryanitch it was all trivial and nonsensical but such reflections did not help him now scarcely had he imagined the earthly globe in a million years when hobotov in his high top boots or mikhail avryanitch with his forced laugh would appear from behind a bare rock and he even heard the shamefaced whisper the warsaw debt i will repay it in a day or two my dear fellow without fail end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Chapters sixteen and seventeen of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter sixteen. One day Mikhail Averyanitch came after dinner when Andrey Yefimitch was lying on the sofa. It so happened that Hobotov arrived at the same time with his bromide andrey yefimitch got up heavily and sat down leaning both arms on the sofa you have a much better colour to-day than you had yesterday my dear man began mikhail Averyanitch. yes you look jolly upon my soul you do it's high time you were well dear colleague said hobotov yawning i'll be bound you are sick of this bobbery and we shall recover said mikhail Averyanitch cheerfully we shall live another hundred years to be sure not a hundred years but another twenty hobotov said reassuringly it's all right all right colleague don't lose heart don't go piling it on we'll show what we can do laughed mikhail Averyanitch, and he slapped his friend on the knee we'll show them yet next summer please god we shall be off to the caucasus and we will ride all over it on horseback trot 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 and when we are back from the caucasus i shouldn't wonder if we will all dance at the wedding mikhail Averyanitch gave a sly wink we'll marry you my dear boy we'll marry you andrey yefimitch felt suddenly that the rising disgust had mounted to his throat his heart began beating violently that's vulgar he said getting up quickly and walking away to the window don't you understand that you are talking vulgar nonsense he meant to go on softly and politely but against his will he suddenly clenched his fists and raised them above his head leave me alone he shouted in a voice unlike his own blushing crimson and shaking all over go away both of you mikhail Averyanitch and hobotov got up and stared at him first with amazement and then with alarm go away both andrey yefimitch went on shouting stupid people foolish people i don't want either your friendship or your medicine stupid man vulgar nasty hobotov and mikhail Averyanitch, looking at each other in bewilderment staggered to the door and went out andrey yefimitch snatched up the bottle of bromide and flung it after them the bottle broke with a crash on the door-frame go to the devil he shouted in a tearful voice running out into the passage to the devil when his guests were gone andrey yefimitch lay down on the sofa trembling as though in a fever and went on for a long while repeating stupid people foolish people when he was calmer what occurred to him first of all was the thought that poor mikhail Averyanitch must be feeling fearfully ashamed and depressed now and that it was all dreadful nothing like this had ever happened to him before where was his intelligence and his tact where was his comprehension of things and his philosophical indifference the doctor could not sleep all night for shame and vexation with himself and at ten o'clock next morning he went to the post office and apologized to the postmaster we won't think of what has happened mikhail Averyanitch, greatly touched said with a sigh warmly pressing his hand let bygones be bygones Lyubavkin, he suddenly shouted so loud that all the postmen and other persons present started hand a chair and you wait he shouted to a peasant woman who was stretching out a registered letter to him through the grating don't you see that i am busy we will not remember the past he went on affectionately addressing andrey yefimitch sit down i beg you my dear fellow for a minute he stroked his knees in silence and then said i have never had a thought of taking offence illness is no joke i understand your attack frightened the doctor and me yesterday and we had a long talk about you afterwards my dear friend why won't you treat your illness seriously you can't go on like this excuse me speaking openly as a friend whispered mikhail Averyanitch. you live in the most unfavourable surroundings in a crowd in uncleanness no one to look after you no money for proper treatment my dear friend the doctor and i implore you with all our hearts listen to our advice go into the hospital there you will have wholesome food and attendance and treatment though between ourselves yevgeny fyodoritch is mauvais ton yet he does understand his work you can fully rely upon him he has promised me he will look after you andrey yefimitch was touched by the postmaster's genuine sympathy and the tears which suddenly glittered on his cheeks my honoured friend don't believe it he whispered laying his hand on his heart don't believe them it's all a sham my illness is only that in twenty years i have only found one intelligent man in the whole town and he is mad 
i am not ill at all it's simply that i have got into an enchanted circle which there is no getting out of i don't care i am ready for anything going to the hospital my dear fellow i don't care if it were into the pit give me your word my dear man that you will obey yevgeny fyodoritch in everything certainly i will give you my word but i repeat my honoured friend i have got into an enchanted circle now everything even the genuine sympathy of my friends leads to the same thing to my ruin i am going to my ruin and i have the manliness to recognize it my dear fellow you will recover what's the use of saying that said andrey yefimitch with irritation there are few men who at the end of their lives do not experience what i am experiencing now when you are told that you have something such as diseased kidneys or enlarged heart and you begin being treated for it or are told you are mad or a criminal that is in fact when people suddenly turn their attention to you you may be sure you have got into an enchanted circle from which you will not escape you will try to escape and make things worse you had better give in for no human efforts can save you so it seems to me meanwhile the public was crowding at the grating that he might not be in their way andrey yefimitch got up and began to take leave mikhail avryanitch made him promise on his honour once more and escorted him to the outer door towards evening on the same day hobotov in his sheepskin and his high top boots suddenly made his appearance and said to andrey yefimitch in a tone as though nothing had happened the day before i have come on business colleague i have come to ask you whether you would not join me in a consultation eh thinking that hobotov wanted to distract his mind with an outing or perhaps really to enable him to earn something andrey yefimitch put on his coat and hat and went out with him into the street he was glad of the opportunity to smooth over his fault of the previous day and to be reconciled and in his heart thanked hobotov who did not even allude to yesterday's scene and was evidently sparing him one would never have expected such delicacy from this uncultured man where is your invalid asked andrey yefimitch in the hospital i have long wanted to show him to you a very interesting case they went into the hospital yard and going round the main building turned towards the lodge where the mental cases were kept and all this for some reason in silence when they went into the lodge nikita as usual jumped up and stood at attention one of the patients here has a lung complication hobotov said in an undertone going into the yard with andrey yefimitch you wait here i'll be back directly i am going for a stethoscope and he went away chapter seventeen it was getting dusk ivan dmitritch was lying on his bed with his face thrust into his pillow the paralytic was sitting motionless crying quietly and moving his lips the fat peasant and the former sorter were asleep it was quiet andrey yefimitch sat down on ivan dmitritch's bed and waited but half an hour passed and instead of hobotov nikita came into the ward with a dressing-gown some under-linen and a pair of slippers and a heap on his arm please change your things your honour he said softly here is your bed come this way he added pointing to an empty bedstead which had obviously recently been brought into the ward it's all right please god you will recover andrey yefimitch understood it all without saying a word he crossed to the bed to which nikita pointed and sat down seeing that nikita was standing waiting he undressed entirely and he felt ashamed then he put on the hospital clothes the drawers were very short the shirt was long and the dressing-gown smelt of smoked fish please god you will recover repeated nikita and he gathered up andrey yefimitch's clothes into his arms went out and shut the door after him no matter thought andrey yefimitch wrapping himself in his dressing-gown in a shamefaced way and feeling that he looked like a convict in his new costume it's no matter it does not matter whether it's a dress coat or a uniform or this dressing gown but how about his watch and the notebook that was in the side pocket and his cigarettes where had nikita taken his clothes now perhaps to the day of his death he would not put on trousers a waistcoat and high boots it was all somehow strange and even incomprehensible at first andrey yefimitch was even now convinced that there was no difference between his landlady's house and ward number six that everything in this world was nonsense and vanity of vanities and yet his hands were trembling his feet were cold and he was filled with dread at the thought that soon ivan dmitritch would get up and see that he was in a dressing-gown he got up and walked across the room and sat down again 
here he had been sitting already half an hour an hour and he was miserably sick of it was it really possible to live here a day a week and even years like these people why he had been sitting here had walked about and sat down again he could get up and look out of window and walk from corner to corner again and then what sit so all the time like a post and think no that was scarcely possible andrey yefimitch lay down but at once got up wiped the cold sweat from his brow with his sleeve and felt that his whole face smelt of smoked fish he walked about again it's some misunderstanding he said turning out the palms of his hands in perplexity it must be cleared up there is a misunderstanding meanwhile ivan dmitritch woke up he sat up and propped his cheeks on his fists he spat then he glanced lazily at the doctor and apparently for the first minute did not understand but soon his sleepy face grew malicious and mocking aha so they have put you in here too old fellow he said in a voice husky from sleepiness screwing up one eye very glad to see you you suck the blood of others and now they will suck yours excellent it's a misunderstanding andrey yefimitch brought out frightened by ivan dmitritch's words he shrugged his shoulders and repeated it's some misunderstanding ivan dmitritch spat again and lay down cursed life he grumbled and what's bitter and insulting this life will not end in compensation for our sufferings it will not end with apotheosis as it would in an opera but with death peasants will come and drag one's dead body by the arms and the legs to the cellar ah well it does not matter we shall have our good time in the other world i shall come here as a ghost from the other world and frighten these reptiles i'll turn their hair grey moiseka returned and seeing the doctor held out his hand give me one little kopeck he said end of chapter seventeen recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapters 18 and 19 of Ward No. 6 by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 18. Andrey Yefimitch walked away to the window and looked out into the open country. It was getting dark, and on the horizon to the right, a cold crimson moon was mounting upwards not far from the hospital fence not much more than two hundred yards away stood a tall white house shut in by a stone wall this was the prison so this is real life thought andrey yefimitch and he felt frightened the moon and the prison and the nails on the fence and the far-away flames at the bone-charring factory were all terrible behind him there was the sound of a sigh andrey yefimitch looked round and saw a man with glittering stars and orders on his breast who was smiling and slyly winking and this too seemed terrible andrey yefimitch assured himself that there was nothing special about the moon or the prison that even sane persons wear orders and that everything in time will decay and turn to earth but he was suddenly overcome with desire he clutched at the grating with both hands and shook it with all his might the strong grating did not yield then that it might not be so dreadful he went to ivan dmitritch's bed and sat down i have lost heart my dear fellow he muttered trembling and wiping away the cold sweat i have lost heart you should be philosophical said ivan dmitritch ironically my god my god yes yes you were pleased to say once that there was no philosophy in russia but that all people even the paltriest talk philosophy but you know the philosophizing of the paltriest does not harm any one said andrey yefimitch in a tone as if he wanted to cry and complain why then that malignant laugh my friend and how can these paltry creatures help philosophizing if they are not satisfied for an intelligent educated man made in god's image proud and loving freedom to have no alternative but to be a doctor in a filthy stupid wretched little town and to spend his whole life among bottles leeches mustard plasters quackery narrowness vulgarity oh my god you are talking nonsense if you don't like being a doctor you should have gone in for being a statesman i could not i could not do anything we are weak my dear friend i used to be indifferent i reason boldly and soundly 
but at the first coarse touch of life upon me i have lost heart prostration we are weak we are poor creatures and you too my dear friend you are intelligent generous you drew in good impulses with your mother's milk but you had hardly entered upon life when you were exhausted and fell ill weak weak andrey yefimitch was all the while at the approach of evening tormented by another persistent sensation besides terror and the feeling of resentment at last he realized that he was longing for a smoke and for beer i am going out my friend he said i will tell them to bring a light i can't put up with this i am not equal to it andrey yefimitch went to the door and opened it but at once nikita jumped up and barred his way where are you going you can't you can't he said it's bedtime but i'm only going out for a minute to walk about the yard said andrey yefimitch you can't you can't it's forbidden you know that yourself but what difference will it make to any one if i do go out asked andrey yefimitch shrugging his shoulders i don't understand nikita i must go out he said in a trembling voice i must don't be disorderly it's not right nikita said peremptorily this is beyond everything ivan dmitritch cried suddenly and he jumped up what right has he not to let you out how dare they keep us here i believe it is clearly laid down in the law that no one can be deprived of freedom without trial it's an outrage it's tyranny of course it's tyranny said andrey yefimitch encouraged by ivan dmitritch's outburst i must go out i want to he has no right open i tell you do you hear you dull-witted brute cried ivan dmitritch and he banged on the door with his fist open the door or i will break it open torturer open the door cried andrey yefimitch trembling all over i insist talk away nikita answered through the door talk away anyhow go and call yevgeny fyodoritch say that i beg him to come for a minute his honour will come of himself to-morrow they will never let us out ivan dmitritch was going on meanwhile they will leave us to rot here oh lord can there really be no hell in the next world and will these wretches be forgiven where is justice open the door you wretch i am choking he cried in a hoarse voice and flung himself upon the door i'll dash out my brains murderers nikita opened the door quickly and roughly with both his hands and his knee shoved andrey yefimitch back then swung his arm and punched him in the face with his fists it seemed to andrey yefimitch as though a huge salt wave enveloped him from his head downwards and dragged him to the bed there really was a salt taste in his mouth most likely the blood was running from his teeth he waved his arms as though he were trying to swim out and clutched at a bedstead and at the same moment felt nikita hit him twice on the back ivan dmitritch gave a loud scream he must have been beaten too then all was still the faint moonlight came through the grating and a shadow like a net lay on the floor it was terrible andrey yefimitch lay and held his breath he was expecting with horror to be struck again he felt as though someone had taken a sickle thrust it into him and turned it round several times in his breast and bowels he bit the pillow from pain and clenched his teeth and all at once through the chaos in his brain there flashed the terrible unbearable thought that these people who seemed now like black shadows in the moonlight had to endure such pain day by day for years how could it have happened that for more than twenty years he had not known it and had refused to know it he knew nothing of pain had no conception of it so he was not to blame but his conscience as inexorable and as rough as nikita made him turn cold from the crown of his head to his heels he leaped up tried to cry out with all his might and to run in haste to kill nikita and then hobotov the superintendent and the assistant and then himself but no sound came from his chest and his legs would not obey him gasping for breath he tore at the dressing-gown and the shirt on his breast rent them and fell senseless on the bed chapter nineteen next morning his head ached there was a droning in his ears and a feeling of utter weakness all over he was not ashamed at recalling his weakness the day before he had been cowardly had even been afraid of the moon had openly expressed thoughts and feelings such as he had not expected in himself before for instance the thought that the paltry people who philosophized were really dissatisfied but now nothing mattered to him he ate nothing he drank nothing he lay motionless and silent it is all the same to me he thought when they asked him questions i am not going to answer it's all the same to me 
after dinner mihail averyanitch brought him a quarter pound of tea and a pound of fruit pastilles daryushka came too and stood for a whole hour by the bed with an expression of dull grief on her face dr hobotov visited him he brought a bottle of bromide and told nikita to fumigate the ward with something towards evening andrey yefimitch died of an apoplectic stroke at first he had a violent shivering fit and a feeling of sickness something revolting as it seemed penetrating through his whole body even to his fingertips strained from his stomach to his head and flooded his eyes and ears there was a greenness before his eyes andrey yefimitch understood that his end had come and remembered that ivan dmitritch mihail averyanitch and millions of people believed in immortality and what if it really existed but he did not want immortality and he thought of it only for one instant a herd of deer extraordinarily beautiful and graceful of which he had been reading the day before ran by him then a peasant woman stretched out her hand to him with a registered letter mihail averyanitch said something then it all vanished and andrey yefimitch sank into oblivion forever the hospital porters came took him by his arms and legs and carried him away to the chapel there he lay on the table with open eyes and the moon shed its light upon him at night in the morning sergey sergeyitch came prayed piously before the crucifix and closed his former chief's eyes next day andrey yefimitch was buried mihail averyanitch and daryushka were the only people at the funeral end of chapter nineteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of ward number six by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six